I'm really truly honored by the presence of you all, uh, physical or virtual, and grateful, of course, to the University of Nicosia and the University of Nicosia Medical School, the academic leadership, and of course the electoral committee for granting me this privilege tonight to address you as newly elected professor. And uh, looking at you, Adelis, indeed, uh, it brings to my mind, uh, of course, you were pivotal member, not just member of that group you mentioned before. And you undertook the great responsibility to lead uh, the course uh, afterwards. And uh, we are all grateful for your contribution and, and the help we had from you all these years. So I thank you. And I remember all the discussions of these uh, difficult years against all odds, but all became reality and look where we are today. Thousands of uh, graduates, hundreds of well-trained and uh, highly privileged faculty all over the world, many programs, international collaborations, the school has grown considerably. And, uh, a lot of this is uh, because of your contribution, the contribution of many, and Professor Andreas Carlampos, to whom we are all grateful. Well, after this uh, emotional introduction, let us get down to business. So tonight, we will try to paint together a new scientific paradigm ought to be the puzzle of a new scientific paradigm, representing thousands of pieces of work in different disciplines, because it's a cross-discipline title. The disciplines of medicine, physics, engineering, mathematics, computer science, and their hybrid sexy child, the analytics, what we call today analytics, as well as epistemology, ethics and law. Some tiny piece of this work, though pioneering, has been carried out by our team in Cyprus and Europe and the US with the collaborators and the many research programs that have been carried out all these years the last 20 years. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin our journey <coughs> by visiting an ICU of 2050, 25 years old. So Mike, Mike, a critically ill 28 years old, elementary school teacher, just graduated from university, contracted the new lethal virus of 2050 and is lying on his bed in muddy organ dysfunction. Do you remember, you all remember, all these tubes, lines, wires that patients used to have to monitor their vital signs? I can see nothing anymore. Wireless sensors, injectable nano laboratories, they are monitoring the function of the organs and they are transmitting wirelessly real-time waveforms of signals and omics, proteomics, genomics, metabolomics parameters from all organs, an enormous time series of data, collected and instantly processed, matched with anonymized patients from millions stored in the pan-European health cloud, to produce personalized and precise decision support to the clinicians. A huge monitoring screen above Mike's head, Mike's bed, smart bed, is reflecting the disease progress and a 3D image, live image of the organs, highlighting the diseased areas. And um, here is our health professionals, the nurse and the doctor, and they are visiting Mike's bed, 
wearing their augmented reality glasses with advanced audio visuals and they are advised real time in connection with patients vital analytics portal on what to target exactly to optimize patients physiology using their free hands healthcare professionals deliver care to Mike and the results of their intervention are visible real time with this analytics. And they can talk, of course, and manage the older support system because they have free hands. And they can instantaneously simulate the result of any intervention they want to do and see what would be the result in order to pick up the best intervention possible. And based on the above, of course, let's say arterial pressure is identified as the driving primary physiologic target and it is set on the value of mean arterial pressure 75 millimeters of mercury, a cardiac output of 4.5 liters and oxygenation levels as global as PO2 at 92%. So they confirm the setting with um, the augmented reality glasses and the organ function command center which drives all the supporting machinery around, around the patient undertakes the responsibility to reach these targets in a safe environment. AI algorithms are used in order to achieve these values and additionally, the system knows that René, the trainee on duty tonight, is only three months in the specialty and needs to learn more in the physiology concept. These algorithms are ideally what we call transparent AI algorithms. So when Mike is not having a vital job to do, the audio visuals in the AR glasses are explaining to him how the algorithms has come to this conclusion. So, this is indeed a picture from the future. Fascinating. A novel holistic model of monitoring homeostatic mechanisms during critical illness and driving therapeutic decisions. So let's explain the title, my dear colleagues. I'm not going to do anything more of that tonight. I'm going to explain the title. So shall we start? What is critical illness? What is really critical illness in the ICU? What type of patients are we treating in the ICU? What is the defining characteristic of somebody who is critically ill? The answer might sound simple. But uh, it's a life-threatening condition, isn't it? Yes? With average mortality of 20-30%. Sure. But cancer also is a life-threatening condition, isn't it? Sometimes with much higher mortality. So what's the difference between the two? Okay, let's be more precise. It's a life-threatening condition that can kill you or make you for life disabled within few minutes or few hours, maximum few days. So that's the difference of the critical illness. That's the first difference. The second difference is that this is happening by sequential organ failure. One organ after the other, if they are not improved through the first 24, 48 hours, critical illness is affecting the organs and each time an organ join the chorus of the insufficient organs then mortality increases by 15 to 20 percent but why why there are three main reasons first because frequently the impact of the disease and the trauma is so powerful that saturates, exhausts, overwhelms 
the individual organs capacity and the whole body's homeostatic mechanisms, another very obscure word for physiology. The capacity to adapt and maintain organ function. Second, because decision making becomes day by day increasingly more complex, more difficult, and consequently prone to mistakes and to some optimal or grossly wrong therapeutic decisions. And third, because the results of these suboptimal decisions possess a cumulative effect. So the one wrong decision sits on the other and the patient goes in the wrong direction. And of course, medical mistakes is another issue. They are quite frequent in the intensive care environment. But the whole impact of the critical illness was really revealed during COVID-19 pandemic. This is a slide from COVID-19 pandemic, and it's not only the millions that they were in the intensive care units, 40, 30, 40 percent of them lost their lives, but it's critical illness is a disease that lasts after critical care four times the average population, the admission in the hospital for those survived from COVID-19 hospitalization. Eight times the mortality the next one, two years now. Respiratory diseases 27 times. Asthma, fibrosis, shortness of breath, unexplained, high embolism, 27 times more. Who is going to get together this catastrophe? Diabetes, three times after hospitalization for COVID-19. All this is a result of what we call critical illness. I'm not going to show slides for everything tonight. It's, it's a change from what I'm doing usually. So please be, be focused and interact with the slides I'm showing. So, I, I mentioned homeostatic mechanisms. What is this? What is homeostatic mechanisms? If we open the physiology books, homeostasis is quite vague. Usually, they are talking about the bicarbonates, that they can adapt pH after carbon dioxide increase. We are talking about homeostasis of temperature, how the body maintains normal temperature. And this is indeed homeostasis. But homeostasis is much more than that. It's the ability, the ability of the body to maintain values within certain limits, not necessarily the physiological limits, to maintain values in combination into certain limits in such way that the minimum economy of the body is achieved with less possible energy and less possible complications. That's homeostasis. It is the opposite of increased entropy. So many times you will hear the term homeostasis and sometimes we hear the term allostasis, a Greek word, which comes from the fact that the physiology of the body can define new physiological values valid only for that moment, for that patient, for that circumstance. So homeostasis is a very tricky concept in human physiology and pathophysiology and it is very difficult to be adjusted and very difficult to be modeled in order to be healed. All right. So let's go back now to intensive care. We have another patient now. We go back, back, back to Christmas 2006. The very first months following the opening of the new ICU in Inquisitor General Hospital. So another patient, Julia. 58 years old, florist, mother of three. Multiple trauma following severe traumatic brain injury. ICU day three, intubated on mechanical ventilation, deeply sedated, ICP monitoring catheter inserted. 
I'm sitting on a chair opposite here, quite exhausted from a long day full of challenges, deeply puzzled with her. She's not quite well. She has sustained a brief period of pauses BT during emergency department admission and aspirated heavy. So now she suffers the consequence of all three episodes. Now I know that for many of you, the terminology and numbers I will mention mean little, but please focus on the concept. Kidneys are developing now in perfusion injury. Lungs are developing ARDS and oxygenation worsens. Intracranial pressure has started picking up because of brain edema, flirting with the 20s. Mean blood pressure is kept above 80 using noradrenaline and intravenous fluids. Glycemic control protocol keeps blood sugar around 160 yeah, milligrams per deciliter using an insulin pump. But she's clearly deteriorating. She's most probably sleeping away. So a series of crucial questions need an answer now at Julia's bedside at that time. But there isn't a single one credible answer in the literature, dear colleagues. Question one, what is the optimum target for arterial blood pressure in order to maintain just enough blood and oxygen flow to the brain above the mean ICP, which the literature says 60 plus for every patient, always, who knows? We cannot measure it. Guideline says nothing. Question two, how much fluid should we give in expense of vasopressors at each given point of time? Brain edema and ARDS with worsening oxygenation indices are the dragons waiting on the other side of this action. How tight the glycemic control should be? Less than 160, 140, 120 perhaps? What's the ideal level to prevent local hypoglycemia in the brain? We cannot monitor. Except if we have a special catheter there, which is not used in every ICU in this planet. So all these questions do not have a guidelines-based answer. And I can assure you, after many years of practice, that they don't have a straightforward answer either for even the most experienced doctor. That's why intermediate hypoxia, hypoxia, hyperoxia are always a problem when we are adjusting oxygen and because we do not have a mobile laboratory into the cellular function of the body and the organs, we don't know what is the result of what we are doing. The doctor is observing everything and using intuition for that. So, let's go to the second law of thermodynamics now. And what's the relevance of the second law of thermodynamics for clinical care? Well, the second law of thermodynamics says that when entropy, another unknown word, is increased, we don't use entropy in physiology today. Yeah, open your books. You will not find this. When entropy increases, then the molecules are maintaining distance between them. They are becoming uncontrollable. So when energy increases, then energy consumption is not affected. The parts of the system become independent and they do not hear each other, they do not act in collaboration, and they are losing their functionality. That's the second law of thermodynamics adapted. Now we'll jump from this to a network analysis of the gene expressions from myocardial ischemia in order to show to you briefly what this new paradigm can do. If you analyze the genes with networks, you will find that when you have treatment for myocardial ischemia, like reperfusion, the O 
opening of the genes is very different than without treatment. And it's very different in a certain pattern. The cooperation between genes is decreased. So the entropy has been increased. This is a whole new aspect of physiology with new terminology that is not used right now into our hospitals. So, based on what I said before, and despite the fact that we like ourselves the way we are practicing medicine and intensive care, nevertheless, only 56 out of 862 randomized controlled trials up to a few years ago, it's an old slide I showed in the European society, had an effect on mortality, ladies and gentlemen. And very few of them have been confirmed by a second randomized control trial. With a fragility index, uh, what is fragility index? It's the number of patients that you need to add to any R of a randomized trial in order to counterbalance the effect, in order to mitigate the effect for the trial to become negative, from positive to positive to negative. Yeah. So reliability. Two. Two means that if, if, if you add two patients to the trial, then the trial changes the result. So low quality trials, why? Why? It's because even simple interventions that we take for granted, I just mentioned interpramial pressure monitor. These are the results that they are ready to be published now from a large consortium which participated a few years ago, Prosaic Consortium. It shows that if you put an ICP or you don't, you make no difference to your patients. No difference in mortality. ICP is a common practice in most ICUs, new ICUs in the world, without single confirmation of its usefulness. And is there any possibility that knowing the intracranial pressure is a useless thing? No. The problem is that we don't know how to use the results. And the treatment is not personalized, but it's protocolized. So that's the big problem of intensive care medicine research. And that's the opportunity for the new paradigm of analyzing biosignals. So the classic research splits the group to two, randomizes the characteristics of the groups, so it does exactly the opposite that real life does. Each patient is different than the other. And actually, in intensive care, there are two characteristics that should preclude the use of randomized control trials. First of all, there is no linear relationship and monotonic effect between the parameters. And second, the confounders for each patient in the groups are absolutely related. If these two exist, then you actually cannot do anything. This is a very interesting graph showing the response of heart rate and blood pressure to more adrenaline. Are we using this graph in intensive care every day? No. We are just increasing and decreasing the doses of more adrenaline, not knowing where we are, in what area we are, are we in the steep area, the flat area, are we in if, if the flat area, you might well understand that if we increase noradrenaline, we're going to damage the patient, because we're going to go into ischemia in the heart and in the intestine. So there's much uncertainty on what we are doing today. The complexity of interactions are many. On this side is three parameters. On that side, many parameters like in sepsis, it's impossible to decide exactly what should be done when the question is not whether you treat with penicillin or not, but the question is a question of optimization of multiple parameters. So, with other conditions remaining the same, other things being equal, shorter hours of labor, they say, will reduce the volume of the output of the work. Actually, 
is the opposite. That's a non-medicine example. And this is a correlation with causality pitfall. So the divorce rate and the consumed margarine are correlated with 0 0.99, you know? So are these two phenomena absolutely correlated? Of course not. Of course not. But they have an R square of more than 95%. What about this? All of these different patterns are data that they are simulated and they look exactly the same when you do classic Y, X, mean analysis. They have the same mean, the same standard deviation in both X, Y and X. But they look completely different. And this is how the data coming from the ICU are. They are non-linear. That's why we need what we call biosignal. And this is a window of opportunity. Blood flow biosignals, venous pressure, venous pressure, cardiac output, perfusion, many biosignals. <coughs> Electrical biosignals are taken from the whole body. All organs are producing biosignals. Airflow biosignals, biorespiratory system, intracranial pressure, transcranial Doppler, pH tonometry, many of them. If you put them on the time domain, that's the first attempt to record biosignals. And to bring you an example that you all know, that's the ECG. So what we know now about the ECG, we see the ECG on the monitor or the paper, and we see the P wave, the R, whether there is any ST elevation, isn't it? Whether is arrhythmia or not. Is this the only information that ECG contains? No. ECG is a huge treasure of different parameters distances, slopes, combination of those. Can we see that on the monitor or on the paper? In order to extract the information from this, we need to go to a very complicated process that was impossible a few years ago. Uh, we have Professor Skizas now from here from BIT that can confirm to you that it's only the last few years that computers are available to, to do that live on live high granularity data coming from. This is also an image of a new from a new technique that is scanning the brain real time without patient being necessary to be transferred to MRI or CT scan, just with the contrast and EEG analysis. It's a special cap carrying 1,200 points of recording and a huge computer power, not huge in size, is analyzing the signals. So, biosignals are talking to each other. We don't hear it, we don't hear the fish talking when we are swimming, but they are too, they do talk to each other. There are examples of this inter-organ crosstalk. We know that from biochemistry, immunoneurometabolic crosstalk in obesity, not only in critical care, left ventricular overload. Organs are talking to each other through metabolites, organ damage in API. So blood vessels, nerves, hormones are cross-communicating and channeling between organs. In order to reach this wealth of information, we need, as I said before, a new product of mathematics and IT, computer science, which is called analytics. This is impossible to process. That's the liver metabolism. I can bring you 20 of those covering the organs. Who is going to make any sense from these kind of metabolic pathways? Who is going to monitor them or try to make sense of their intersection? But this, hmm, they are in front of us. They are recorded. And now we know very well how to purify them and how to analyze them. 
And that's the model we are proposing for the new monitoring in the ICU for the future. I'm not going to bother you with the technicalities of how we analyze these messages. I'm just telling you that this is a very interesting process that expands the characteristics first, creates many parameters from the signal, and then the computer downsizes the information and comes to a two-dimensional picture. It's not anymore the ST elevation or other things that we are used to learn from our medical knowledge. They're new computer-derived parameters, but they can monitor and define the patient's outcome. Are there any evidence out there for this? So this is, for instance, something that is monitoring the change in cross-communication. This has been recorded live and processed live from biosignals. This is a processing that we can predict where the system will be if we do something. And most importantly, where would be if we don't do something. This distance has a special terminology now. All these new concepts are not taught in medical schools, are not taught in specialties. This is a new era coming. Few examples. EEG, derived indices in patients with loss of consciousness, yes? They can predict the outcome of loss of consciousness in comatose patients that we are sometimes puzzled. Is this patient going to wake up ever or not? Machine learning models predicting the mortality of sepsis, 80 to 90% of fitness, these are the receiver operating characteristic curves, the rock curves, that they are representing the analysis. Deep learning approach to prediction of hypoxemic events in critically ill patients using SpO2 waveform. So SpO2 is running on the monitor. What do we see? Only the number. We say 92, 93. Ah, oh, the patient is okay. But this is valuable. If we analyze SpO2, we can predict 30 minutes in advance if the patient will drop the oxygen. Why this is useful? <laughs> well, that's why. The conventional methods of predicting whether somebody will successfully be extubated, weaned off from the ventilation, which is a sacred process in ICU is based on what we call a TV trial, yeah, or a pure support trial. What do we do? Exactly this, 30 minutes of trial, and based on the results, the sensitivity and specificity are very similar, are very similar. 3,165 3, very reliable meta-analysis is confirming that the successful extubation rate is 74%. This is exactly what we can do by analyzing 15 minutes of biosignals from SPO2. These are early signs of success. Another one, machine learning process for automatic diagnosis of ventilator asynchrony. How many of our intensivists are able to diagnose ventilator asynchrony from the traces that we see on the ventilator or the monitor. Very few, because it's difficult. Because it's difficult. Machine learning can tell us immediately whether there is or there is not. Important? That's why. <coughs> Those that they are, they have this ventilator asynchrony, they have significantly, significantly bigger mortality. And the reliability of prediction is 95%. Patient, patient ventilator asynchrony, meta-analysis, odds ratio 2.73. So those with ventilator asynchrony, they have 
danger to die almost three times more than others. Are we interested to know that? Of course. Of course we are. This method is novel and is holistic. The era of prospective randomized control trials and the dictatorship of the mean and the inferred statistics is ending. There is a discontinuity, and we are there, I believe, but the new era of machine learning, new mathematics, and analysis of information is coming in medicine very fast. And it is my recommendation that medical schools start to prepare the new doctors for what is coming. Because the new doctors, they need to know, they need to have an opinion about it, and they need to participate meaningfully, knowing things about it. What will be the rules? Yes? So the two models, the randomized control trials, inference, versus the machine learning, augmented intelligence algorithmic prediction. Why this is a model? I'm not going to bother you with this. It fulfills all the epistemological characteristics of a new model. Semantics, ontology, epistemology. Semantics means phenomenology, setting the boundaries, system interactions, data model, data curation, all these methodological things. Ontology, what does they mean? All these terminologies I mentioned before, that is the first time I hear it and you hear it. They need to be recorded and taught. And of course, epistemology, the model's cognitive function. What kind of questions a new model can answer? And I gave you a few examples of the questions that can be answered. Are there any randomized control trials now of machine learning interventions versus standard care? A number of them, they do not fulfill the criteria of the committee that decided that these criteria should be applied in all machine learning trials. Consort AI for those that are interested, is the committee and the group of criteria. Many studies do not fulfill this criteria, so it's early. What I showed to you is not the miracle, it is the signs of a possible miracle, a possible revolution in our monitoring in the ICU. This is a publication we did many years ago with Professor Dikiakos from the University of Cyprus and other colleagues recording signals from the monitoring system almost 15 years ago. And after this, there is a lot of human organization, technological challenges in order to implement this method. We need to share data, and it's not easy at all in Europe at this time to share data. But there is a journey, EU Health Data Protection Journey, that goes into this direction, and we are actively participating into this journey, trying to push things forward in a healthy way. Choice of methods, or in AI, different methods have different transparency, so they are the full black boxes method. We don't know what's going on in We just give data in and have the result. And we have also auditable algorithms on the other side. These kind of methods, they answer different questions. So it's very important for the scientific community to participate into this process meaningfully. That's another example of artificial intelligent clinician which predicted correctly the amount of noradrenaline and fluids that we should give in septic shock in order to have optimum outcome when it was trained from previous data. This is one of our colleagues at um, uh, Guy St. Thomas's hospital in London. Explainable AI, that's the hot terminology now. Artificial intelligence, which is based on very strict process that give us the reliability that this is something that we can use and we can trust. 
and this is a very important ethical and legal consideration today. And these are the projects that we have participated the last uh, uh, 15 years, but they are pointing towards this direction from different aspects. Still much to do, and the University of Nicosia Medical School is, um, wants to play a significant role in this, in this pathway, and we want to create research groups with the participation of young doctors and students that they are interested to learn more. Yeah, many research programs and the future. I started with this, I'm ending with this, but that's a, that's a beautiful drawing, a beautiful paper that my dear wife gave me yesterday. That was a uh, contribution to my lecture today. And uh, my thing is that they presented them at the end. Um, all this process starts from the need, from a real need. Many of you are working in the intensive care and the you know what I mean. But it is love and educated intuition in order to proceed in this road. And of course, it's very important to have faith in what you're doing and you need to very robustly working and standing on scientific evidence in order to have regulations, scientific regulations. So, uh, thank you Maria, for providing me this, uh, this slide. That's exactly um, what you're supporting me to do the last many years. And um, with this, I'm going to end this presentation. And I will be happy to answer any questions if they are. Thank you.